Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Mark Erkin, and welcome again to uh, Friday Morning Virtual uh, Journal Club. Um, I am really thrilled to um, be able to introduce a, a colleague and friend, Dr. Joseph Sharp, who's Professor of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery in the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine, a member of the Cleveland Clinic's Head and Neck Institute. Uh, he is also Director of Head and Neck Endocrine Surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. So Dr. Sharp earned his medical degree from the Ohio State University College of Medicine and Public Health, um, where he was inducted into the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society. Um, and then he undertook fellowship training after completing his residency. Um, and that fellowship was at the University of Iowa in advanced head, neck, cancer, endocrine, and reconstructive surgery, and then returned to the Cleveland Clinic, where he has spent the remainder of his career to date. Um, Dr. Sharp has published and lectured extensively, both nationally and um, internationally, while also dedicating a significant part of his career to teaching medical students, residents, and fellows. And it's, his, it's really um, related to his work in thyroidology, in thyroidology that we've asked him to speak this morning on the very important topic of intraoperative nerve monitoring. This is a topic that is of considerable importance to surgeons and has not been covered in significant detail in the clinical practice guidelines of any of the major societies, including the ATA. And so while long considered this to be a nuance of surgical management, an understanding of nerve monitoring as well as the implications for patient management um, is really of uh, vital importance for all specialties. And so um, I think that having an understanding of how this works, what the, um, how it impacts patient care, I think is no longer strictly limited to the realm of, um, of surgery. And so it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Sharp, who's both a, a colleague and friend, as I mentioned. Um, I thank you for joining us this, mo this morning and encourage all of you uh, to submit your questions, which I'll try to get to um, at the end here. So with that, uh, Joe, thank you very much. Thank, thank you thank you very much, Dr. Erkin. This is a real honor to be here. It's been a wonderful series. I've learned quite a bit myself uh, and um, looking forward to uh, the discussion here. And so I'm gonna speak on the international guidelines for intraoperative neural monitoring. I have no disclosures. I'm coming, as Dr. Erkin said, from the Cleveland Clinic on uh, Lake Erie Shore. My office is right here in what's called the Cryo Building. And it's named after one of our founders, George Kreil. And I put this up because Dr. Kreil has many achievements, including the discussion of the uh, radical neck dissection, but he also holds the record for the most thyroids in one day at the Cleveland Clinic. It still stands at 33 thyroids in one day. Uh, back then they did not do nerve monitoring. And so one of my disclosures or caveats is to beware if you're gonna do this nerve monitoring, which I highly encourage, you might have to cut down your volume maybe from the 33 a day for thyroids. Um, much of what I'm gonna speak about comes from this document uh, and other documents from the International Neuro Monitoring Study Group for which Dr. Erkin has also been a member. Uh, this was a group founded back in 2006 by Dr. Greg Randolph and Dr. Henning Drale from uh, Germany, Dr. Randolph from Boston. Um, this document was published actually just two, two and a half years ago in the laryngoscope. And it basically goes through two parts, part one, goes through staging of bilateral thyroid surgery with loss of signal, looking to make thyroid surgery safer. And then there's a part two where it incorporates surgical laryngeal and uh, electrophysiologic data for invasive cancers. And I'm gonna cover a lot of the points in these documents, but they are there for review and for uh, uh, study. Um, Dr. Randolph, when he was the president of the American Academy of Otolaryngology, um, was uh, instrumental in setting up a cranial nerve monitoring task force. And these were the members of the task force. From that task force, a position statement has been placed on the American Academy website, which you can see. And we do have a uh, document coming out that will be a clinical uh, review of the uh, nerve monitoring that we'll speak about. So my objectives today are really to focus on uh, incorporation of nerve monitoring to the surgical strategy. Uh, particularly the vagus recurrent nerve, the rationale and indications, uh, looking at methods, some emerging trends, and then some of the troubleshooting and options to manage loss of signal. This should cover a lot of uh, points germane to all physicians taking care of thyroid patients, 
and give some more understanding even to our non-surgical colleagues. So the complete and applied understanding of the neurophysiologic principles facilitates the surgeon's ability to monitor any nerve. And so intraoperative nerve monitoring, neural stimulation serve to allow for optimal neural detection, to understand neural function real time during the surgery and optimize certain surgical outcomes, particularly thyroid surgeries. And so this electrophysiologic data set is really additive to the knowledge of the anatomy and excellent surgical technique. It does not replace those issues. It allows a surgeon to go simple, beyond simple appreciation of the integrity of a nerve and realize really what the overarching goal is, is the function of the nerve. And so the big question then becomes, is it acceptable in 2021 to just simply see these recurrent nerves, which is always still remains the gold standard, or do you need to know function? And I still get a couple of calls every year from very good surgeons at times where they've seen both the nerves and all of a sudden the patient woke up in airway distress. They needed to be reintubated. They may have even needed a tracheotomy. They've been put in a bit of a life-threatening position. I've also seen many patients at times come in uh, where they may have a vocal cord injury after a thyroid surgery. And I'll look back at the operative note and see that that side where the injury was was on the first side operate on. So it makes me wonder that there could have been many near misses of that situation. And when I talk about that situation, this is a patient that was transferred to our center from a very good surgeon just a week or two ago. It'll be a little cloudy, but this was the laryngeal examination. The patient had a bilateral injury after a total thyroidectomy, passed out on the floor. They thought she was vagal, vasovagal, but she actually passed out and was in a lot of distress. And this is the situation where we're absolutely trying to avoid this situation for our patients to make thyroid surgery safer and never really be in this position of a bilateral weakness. So looking at some of the applications of nerve monitoring, the nerve monitoring does facilitate visual identification. In fact, about 35% of cases, you'll have some nerve identification before visual in terms of an electrical stimulation. So it can improve the speed of the identification. There are many anatomic variants, as all surgeons know, of the normal recurrent laryngeal nerve, where you have extra laryngeal spreading of the nerve, particularly an anterior motor branch that has a very important uh, significance to map that out and make sure that that nerve is not being injured. It gives you important nerve prognostication information. So knowing that the nerve is okay on one side before you go to the other side is critical so you don't get in that situation that I just described with a bilateral problem where you could go ahead and stage the surgery. Um, you can at times in, uh, predict an impending injury, particularly when we talk about some continuous monitoring. Uh, you can alter your associated maneuver and take the traction off a nerve. It can help improve the superior laryngeal nerve in identification and preserve it when you can identify it. It is an important educational adjunct, teaching you maybe what your touch might be on the nerve or on how you're managing tissue. Um, it can help, and I'll show a case of a non-recurrent laryngeal nerve to identify it. And although a little controversial, it has been described by Alessini that there's improved paralysis rates really for younger surgeons who are just starting that might not have as much experience. It brings their rates of nerve paralysis uh, approaching those of more experienced surgeons. So it does improve paralysis rates for younger surgeons approaching uh, those of more experienced surgeons. So in terms of safety, of course, is always important. And so there's been very rare local and cardiac events. The main issue is really if there's a high frequency probe, more than 30 Hertz, and that's never used in nerve monitoring. Our instruments do not show that kind of frequency when we go to stimulate a nerve. And so through multiple large series, uh, vagal recurrent nerve, cardiac, pulmonary safe um, outcomes, uh, Schneider from Germany has looked at continuous nerve monitoring. It's been safe in AV block patients safe in the pediatric population. In a balanced and objective discussion of this, there have been some case reports by Teresa and Ulmer about some adverse effects with repetitive stimulation. Although I said any nerve can be uh, looked at and monitored, we're gonna focus primarily on the recurrent nerve and, and the superior nerve as these are most important for thyroid surgery. And so uh, those nerves uh, will innervate the vocalis, cricothyroid, and uh, cricoarytenoid muscle. And you can see uh, when we do nerve monitoring, it doesn't necessarily always have to be just about an EMG wave signal. You can see visible muscle responses, particularly on the cricothyroid muscle when you stimulate it. 
you can have a palpable twitch, which we'll talk about, which is very important. So if you touch the nerve with a stimulator at one milliamp, you will feel the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle twitch. And so you can monitor how it's how it's been affected from your surgery in that manner if you don't have uh, an endotracheal tube that will monitor. Um, looking at evoked EMGs, you can actually look at objective EMG data to see how the nerve is responding to your surgery. Uh, and then finally, uh, passive monitoring is uh, available as well with continuous monitoring uh, available with the recurrent nerve as well. And so as we look at how nerves are injured, it's important to touch upon this. Um, most of the time, particularly for experienced surgeons, it's not usually a situation of not finding the nerve or transecting it, although with all humility, anything can happen in surgery. But more often, the issue is traction or how you handle heat and compression around the nerve, particularly around the ligament of Barry. And those are the things we emphasize a lot in our surgical technique with our trainees. But also clamping, ligature entrapment, suction-related injuries, all mechanisms of um, injury. The most serious injuries for long-term weakness would be thermal clamping and transection, of course. So it's difficult to totally obtain uh, the exact rates of vocal cord paralysis. Uh, it's actually best to look at some national database studies from Scandinavia. And in those uh, databases, they've got a range of 6 to 9.8%. And then those rates, um, based on symptoms only, start to double when you start to do po routine postoperative laryngeal examination. Similarly, it's difficult to look at bilateral vocal cord rates. For example, the patient I just showed, had she not had that episode or been transferred in, perhaps may have recovered one side, it's difficult to say. Um, but uh, when it does happen, about 45% of the time it can be permanent, and it could raise the risk as much as 30% for a tracheotomy for just a life-threatening um, experience for the patient. So as we go on the Nerve Monitored Study Group, the International Nerve Monitored Study Group document that I already talked about, these are the type of tables that come up in that document that really outline a plan of care to make surgery safer for patients. And that's really the big thing that we're looking to do. We're not looking necessarily always to uh, prevent nerve injury. A lot of that's from your experience and from your technique, but rather making it safer. And that's what we're talking to the patients about. And, and I'll go into that a little bit more detail. But for a patient who is planning on having a bilateral thyroidectomy, we start on the dominant side, if there is a loss of signal um, with no recovery, then you complete the side, but you do not want to go to the other side. Now, you have to have a signal to begin with. So in that International Nerve Study Group document, they will recommend that you get a baseline vagal signal to have a signal first to make sure that the signal is intact. And we'll go over some of the troubleshooting algorithms if you don't have that initial signal. But once you have a loss of signal and no recovery intraoperatively, you want to complete the first side and it gives you pause to go to the other side. And so your management options then for the contralateral side would be to stage that surgery. So in other words, many of the times this might be a temporary neuropraxia from traction. The patient will recover and you can bring them back for a staged surgery where it's safer to do the other side so you don't get a problem on the same side. Um, it would be rarely performed to do a total, uh, even in high risk thyroid cancers, there may be the possibility certainly to just come back at another time. You want to avoid that tracheotomy on your patient. And so when you have that loss of signal and there's no, incomplete, there's no or incomplete recovery, you stage the surgery. Basically, you, this is the recommended algorithm to do laryngoscopy on the patient uh, every couple of weeks for a couple of months post-op to see how they're doing. If they've had laryngeal recovery, you can go back and complete the other side. Maybe you might want to reevaluate the need for surgery based on pathology if it's even needed. Maybe there's a need for multidisciplinary consideration of non-surgical options. If you have no laryngeal recovery, once again, I think this is best to have a, this multidisciplinary approach. At my own center, we not only have a head and neck tumor board, we also have a head and neck, uh, I'm sorry, a thyroid tumor board as well. And so it's good to have this multidisciplinary uh, approach for complex patients and consider other options. These are the type of tables that you will see in the, um, in the uh, document about um, what a loss of signal exactly means and what you should be aware of. And some of it is uh, very characteristic for a traffic signal, green, keep going, caution with yellow, and then 
really stop with with red don't run through your red light and so on a green um everything is going well with a stable intra or intraoperative normal emg the amplitude is more than 50 percent of that initial baseline and your latency has not decreased so it's less than uh 10 percent it hasn't uh gotten worse um if you start to have an impending adverse emg that's where the amplitude is getting to be more than 50 percent from the initial baseline or you're having a latency increase of more than 10% off the initial baseline, you're starting to worry a little bit more about the health of that nerve, even though you see the nerve is anatomically intact, you're getting more concerned. In fact, 90 something percent of nerve injuries are actually in normally visually intact nerves. It's, it's really this functional issue that's so important. And then when you get to red, that's where your amplitude has gone under 100 microvolts, and usually you've had a latency increase of more than 10%, and your baseline um, amplitude has gone down quite dramatically, as I've said, below 100. And so there are other guidelines, consensus statements from the American Academy of Otolaryngology, the American Head and Neck Society, the American Thyroid Association. None of these guidelines speak against the use of nerve monitoring. And so in the American Academy of Otolaryngology, uh, there were uh, guidelines published in 2013 uh, with special utility for doing nerve monitoring in bilateral thyroid surgery, as I showed, to try to prevent that nerve injury bilaterally, revision surgery, whether it's a recurrence or need for further surgery, and in the setting of an existing paralysis. There are statements that have come out uh, from uh, Dr. Maisie Shindo from the American Head and Neck Society with invasive cancer, uh, uh, suggesting the use of and, and recommending the use of uh, nerve monitoring. We've also had um, papers come out from the American Head Society in the setting of recurrent thyroid cancer, uh, recommending the consideration for uh, nerve monitoring in this particular situation. Uh, the American Thyroid Association in recommendation uh, 42 does say that visual identification of the nerve is required in all cases. Uh, steps should be taken to, to preserve the external branch as well of the superior laryngeal nerve. And then it did say that intraoperative nerve monitoring um, stimulation with or without monitoring may be considered to facilitate nerve identification and confirm neural function. In parathyroid surgery, it becomes a little bit more controversial, not as much as been written. Um, I did write a chapter for Dr. Stack's book on parathyroid surgery. Uh, it is difficult to always anticipate which cases will be more challenging. The routine nerve identification is not always present during parathyroid surgery. We're often using very small incisions, minimal or even remote access. And in an interesting study by Ansh, there was anatomic proximity of the recurrent nerve um, to adenomas, uh, particularly in the right upper one. About 47% of the time was touching the right upper parathyroid. So where are things going in terms of trends of using this technology? Well, more than 95% of endocrine surgery fellows are exposed to nerve monitoring during their fellowship, many different applications. Higher volume surgeons, interestingly, use it far more. 80% of the thyroid surgeons are perform surgeries are performed by head and neck surgeons in the US and 65% by uh, general surgeons in the US. Um, I will continue to emphasize that the recurrent nerve visualization is the gold standard, but the, the central dogma of nerve monitoring is that a visualized and structurally intact nerve does not guarantee normal postoperative function. And so I'm going to start with a, a little case here that I had from my own practice. Uh, it's a patient who had had a, a bit of a compressive goiter who was followed in multidisciplinary fashion with the endocrinologist for several years, was becoming more symptomatic, um, and ultimately made the decision, uh, engaging that patient, the decision to go forward with surgery. Um, the um, interesting part of this cross-sectional CT scan is that my own center didn't actually notice this aberrant subclavian artery. And I really emphasize to our residents fellows to always uh, read their own films. And so when I saw this here, this aberrant subclavian artery, it really certainly makes you concerned that there's a non-recurrent laryngeal nerve on the right side. And there's other ways you could find that. I always look on the ultrasound to follow the uh, vessels down to see if there's that aberrancy as well on the right side. But nevertheless, I um, decided to uh, start on this particular patient on the left side because I knew there was probably a non-recurrent nerve here on the right side. The um, surgery actually went quite well. I found the nerve without any difficulty, 
but sure enough, it was a rare circumstance, but I ended up losing signal. And um, this is one of those situations that can be so valuable to your trainees and uh, your residents, and where you just have to take a step back a little bit, and after about 20 minutes, which is within the guidelines, there was not a vibrant return of signal, where you have to say, look, we should stage this surgery, and uh, keeping the patient's safety and interest uh, in mind and not worrying about personal reputation, your schedule, what have you. And so this is a situation where I held off on doing the other side. The patient actually had a rapid reconstitution of function within a couple of weeks, and I came back and did the other side. And the patient was very grateful for that. I talked to the patient about every patient about that possibility. And so it's not a situation where they were uncomfortable afterwards or overly disappointed. They, they realized that possibility. And so there is normative EMG data within that document about what would be a normal amplitude, and you want to get used to these EMG readings and what the data means. It is not really good enough just to put a nerve monitoring tube into someone and not take the time to understand what it means. In other words, you need to understand what data you're getting back during those type of cases to see this is not a good amplitude, this is not a good latency, we have to change our approach. And, and it's not something that's just put in there um, for uh, the sake of making a patient feel happier that they have a nerve monitoring tube. You really have to take the time personally to understand and educate yourself on it. And so there is data, norm of data for the non-recurrent laryngeal nerve. And so even though I had that feeling that there was a non-recurrent nerve, which there was on that side, and it was not difficult to dissect and take out in the stage fashion, um, you can find that non-recurrent nerve in other ways through nerve monitoring. And what you will see is uh, a non-recurrent nerve will come out uh, with a shorter latency because it's not coming down around the subclavian. This is the aberrant subclavian artery behind the trachea. And so if you stimulate it right here, interestingly, you're not going to get a nerve st stimulation because there's no recurrent nerve coming back up into the, uh, into the patient. So you can map out where that non-recurrent laryngeal nerve may be coming. So it can be a very nice adjunct in this suspected case of what's going on. Or if you didn't suspect it, if you're not getting a signal when you, when you stimulate here distal to where the non-recurrent nerve comes off, it may give you an indication that you're dealing with a non-recurrent nerve. The standard devices that we most commonly use are these uh, endotracheal tubes that will have an electrode placed right uh, on the tube itself to give you that feedback. And then, um, we typically often use the PRAS Pro. PRAS was actually a former nurse surgeon here at my own institution. Um, uh, and But there are bipolar stimulator probes available, but we typically don't use a, the bipolar stimulator. Um, there have been other strategies to do nerve monitoring. And in this study from Dr. Randolph, uh, he looked at a, a anterior laryngeal uh, electrodes for recurrent laryngeal nerve monitoring during thyroid, parathyroid, looking at a better way to do it because that tube can shift quite a bit in a patient and be malpositioned. And so in his study, he put electrodes right on the patient. And interestingly, it allows the surgeon to control the operating field. It avoids that endotracheal tube malpositioning concern, gives you a more robust monitoring signal of the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve innervating the cricothyroid muscles. Um, one of the other techniques that is certainly available uh, is continuous nerve monitoring. And the advantage of the continuous nerve monitoring is that you are having um, feedback directly to see if you're starting to lose signal for perhaps a traction issue near the ligament of Berry. And so the probe is placed on the vagus nerve and every five, six seconds you have a uh, stimulation placed to give you that continuous stimulation. In other words, when you're just using a PRAS probe, that's intermittent. And these type of um, uh, strategies are not necessarily exclusive of each other. They could be used in a complementary fashion. And so this is what you want to do. You want to prevent that little nerve from being stretched and having traction on it. And that is really where most of our injuries happen, right about there at the ligament of Berry, uh, where it becomes fixed. And so this has been reported by Snyder, Ch Chang, others about the, the most common site of injury for the nerve. Um, when you do continuous nerve monitoring, uh, what you will start to see uh, if you're having a traction injury is that decrease of amplitude and an increase of latency. And this can be put right on the monitor to give you information about what is happening to that nerve. And so as you look at the different profiles of nerve injury, 
uh, and loss of signal. This is amplitude over time and loss of signal. So you're losing amplitude, losing the nerve. So if you were to just transect the nerve, if you came in uh, with your uh, instrument and you're indiscriminate and you just cut the nerve, well, there's no monitoring. There's nothing that's going to be able to prevent that kind of injury. It's an injury. It happens right away immediately. Um, similar with cautery. But if you're having an issue of compression or traction, stretch, that's happening over a period of time where you're losing that signal. And it is something where you might uh, be able to um, change your pattern. So even on intraoperative nerve monitoring, when I'm doing intermittent nerve monitoring, if I'm getting a lot of feedback signal, I might move away from that area of the ligament of Berry, work on other parts of the thyroid, give it some rest, and then come back to it to try to prevent that if I'm not doing continuous nerve monitoring. So the type, amount, and speed of the onset of injury is important. The nature of the EMG change is important. And then that slope is important. And, and there's a different profile for these injuries. And so you do get to a point with an absolute EMG of a non-recovery point here. So in a different way of looking at this, uh, you have your surgical maneuver. There might be some EMG changes occurring. Uh, about most of the time is due to that stretch at the ligament of Berry, and you might want to abort that maneuver, take a cha chance or a change in the, in the procedure to go to another area, and then hopefully you have a resolution of the signal. The signal comes back and you continue on with your surgery. If you lose the signal, as I showed in the one case, you really have to uh, strongly consider, I'd advise, holding off and staging the surgery. Um, and so if you don't change the maneuver, that could certainly happen as well. Um, I'm going to um, just cover a little briefly uh, a very important newer emerging trend that Dr. Erkin has been involved with a lot and Dr. Sinclair, who um, has been really instrumental in, in, in describing this and pushing this forward as well, is something called the laryngeal adductor reflux. And this has been published by them in, in multiple papers now. And it's very exciting to see this presented at many of our national and international meetings, but I, I, although don't have any experience with it myself, I mean, Dr. Urkel will comment at the end, but it is a protective reflex that prevents aspiration by causing thyroarytenoid, lateral cricoarytenoid muscle contraction, and you get vocal cord closure. And so it's a reliable, present in humans under general anesthesia, and it does allow you to continuously monitor that recurrent nerve function. And similarly, if you're starting to lose that signal, you're gonna to start to be concerned that if the amplitude frequency starts to go down and doesn't recover, that you're going to have a higher likelihood of hypomobility. And it's a way of getting that continuous feedback during your operation. So it's very important that you're not only versed with the importance of amplitude and the EMG curves and what all these signals mean, but you also have to be versed with how to deal with troubleshooting because none of these systems are perfect. And it's important to have some tricks and be able to manage through these, these systems so that you, you know how to best apply them to your patients. And so one of the questions that I think can start off is, do you do it on all your thyroids or you just do it on your more difficult ones? Like I mentioned, maybe the revision case or the invasive case. Well, it is once again, difficult to predict which cases are hard. There is a learning curve. And so to facilitate that learning curve and because you can't predict which cases are always gonna be difficult and we want to, distribute benefit to all our patients. I'd often say uh, consider them on all the patients. I was a bit of a late adapter to actually using nerve monitoring. I was very much in tune with um, you know, uh, finding the nerve and being very focused. And every time the, the machine went off a little bit, it kind of threw off a little bit of my efficiency of thought and then obviously efficiency of the operation. Um, but even then, when I wasn't using uh, EMG signals or intraoperative nerve monitoring, I would always do a palpation twitch and test for the function of the nerve before moving to the other side. And so it is an important uh, way for you to always know what that status of the nerve is before uh, putting the patient in particularly significant harm. Um, I think the preoperative discussion is critical. Expectations to the patient of what intraoperative nerve monitoring can and cannot do in the preoperative discussion and consent process. Uh, is vital. I do not tell these patients I'm doing nerve mining to prevent nerve injuries for them. The nerve injury prevention is really through your surgical technique, your experience, the way that you, you go about treating the tissue. However, I do talk to them about how it could help us manage the safety profile of the procedure and how if we're doing a total thyroidectomy, um, I have um, 
never had a bilateral injury where I've had to do a, a tracheotomy on one of my patients, but I've taken care of patients from very good surgeons here in other places and certainly can happen. We want to avoid that at all possible cost. And so once they get that, they understand, they understand what the logic is for this. I think it helps to alleviate perhaps some of the psychological burn on the surgeon and the, and the freedom to do the best intraoperative decision. I showed you my own personal case where, boy, is it frustrating to lose a signal on a patient and to have to stage. But I think when you've had that discussion with the patient ahead of time and your goals are clear that you don't want to put them in that harm's way for a possible tracheotomy, it becomes easier to make the proper decision. And, and so you don't want to be worried about your surgical schedule, about getting them back on another time or reputational concerns. And one of the mottos at my own institution is just simply patients first. And I think it's a great motto to just always keep in mind for any facet of care. So it's important to be involved initially with the intubation and tube positioning. Um, it's a shared airway. I showed you those endotracheal tubes. If they're in an inappropriate position, you're not going to get the proper signals coming back. And so you want to be there. You want your anesthesiologist to be aware of it. I recently gave a talk to the Society for Head and Neck Anesthesia uh, and, and kind of went over this. And they were all mostly on board. All these anesthesiologists get this and why we want to be involved with the, with the airway and, and where that tube positioning is going to be. There have been studies that will show that that tube will move dramatically after you extend a patient or move it. And so you may want to consider taking a relook at the um, tube. Um, there is a short period of respiratory um, variability right before they go into um, more of their full general anesthesia where you can see if the uh, tube is in a position and you're getting signals back. It's not really recommended like a facial nerve monitor to just do a, a palpation kind of tapping on the, on the neck, although we often sometimes do do that. Um, but really, those would be better uh, ways of analyzing the system. And then also looking at the impedance on your monitor to see if there's resistance and how these electrodes are touching. Um, of course, neuromuscular blockade is going to be a problem. No, if it's something very short acting like succinylcholine, which we often use, where it's going to wear off quite quickly, that's fine. But we don't want that to be given while we're actively and being uh, exposed to nerve monitoring because we won't be able to get the proper nerve monitoring with the neuromuscular blockade. Um, looking at some applications here with um, uh, tips or tricks here, um, sometimes you may uh, find yourself in a redo uh, revision operation. I've certainly found those situations quite often. And um, it's nice to somehow uh, take your nerve probe and you could sometimes map out the nerve at uh, two milliamps and, and see it a little bit through the scar, so to speak. And so this was a patient I had who was actually 26 years old. She had had five surgeries prior to seeing me for an invasive thyroid cancer. Her nerve had been functioning preoperatively. I knew there was gonna be a very high probability that we would probably have to take her nerve. Uh, but as I got in there and was able to map out the nerve, the caliber of the nerve was okay. It was not grossly involved. There's gross you know, invasion to all her musculature and other areas that we grossly uh, took out. And then um, she's actually done very well. We did give her post-operative external beam radiation because of the nature of this on pathology and what we were dealing with. But we actually preserved her nerve. And that was very helpful, having the nerve monitoring to map out all the little branches of the nerve as well uh, through this uh, very densely adherent scar bed, which I had never seen before. She had had four outside operations. Um, Looking at the part two of this document that we talked about from the International Nerve Monitoring Study Group, uh, there's particularly great value in this for invasive thyroid cancer. And so um, you will certainly get into these situations where you may find a nerve that you cannot spare, where it has been grossly involved, grossly enlarged. And so in those situations, uh, again, data, objective EMG data about the nature of the nerve uh, is very, very important to see how that nerve is functioning and can help uh, play a role in your decision-making process. And so you may have a situation where you get into a thyroid and a nerve resection may be required. You may see a nerve like I just showed. You would want to really consider performing a contralateral dissection first before resecting that nerve to make sure that you don't have loss of signal, and then you can go back and resect the invaded nerve. If you have a loss of signal, perhaps from 
a traction issue or what have you, you might be able to come back at a secondary time once there's a recovery of the neuropraxia. And so something to think about, and that's where nerve monitoring can be so valuable in terms of giving you some of that information objectively about how to deal with these nerves that are grossly invaded and uh, need management. Um, this is another nerve that um, was uh, grossly involved. The patient actually had an excellent voice. He had, a, um, interestingly, a lipoma taken out by one of my partners. And during the workup, they found this thyroid cancer that was worked up. His voice was excellent. One of my residents said, don't worry about scoping because one of my partners had scoped him a few months prior. I said, you know what, let me just take a look. I agree, the voice sounds great. And sure enough, when I looked at his vocal cords, he had a, an immobility of the cord, but there was still good... Um, density of his vocal cord and um, uh, basically through the neurotrophic factors and uh, muscle tone, the voice was excellent. And now, so this is a patient where you're looking at this situation clinically. Uh, ultimately, we decided to take this nerve and I'm glad we did. It was just infiltrated with cancer throughout. But that's one of those situations where uh, the EMG can be very helpful to see, uh, is this a nerve that looks like it should be spared or should we take it? And so sure enough, the nerve was taken because of it. We had to take some of the muscle of the esophagus and the patient has done actually quite well long-term. Um, when we look at the troubleshooting algorithms, one of the most in, in, uh, common issues is that endotracheal tube malposition. And so you can have either a recording side problem or a stimulation side problem. Once again, this is all coming from that document that I've referred you to. And so if you have a loss of signal when you're in your operation, one of the things I find so important is doing that laryngeal twitch. When you simply feel the cricho, uh, posterior cricorytenoid muscle and, and stimulate the nerve, if you feel a very vibrant twitch at one milliamp, I've had mentors that have told me they've never had a false positive on that. They've always had good nerve function afterwards. And, and it's kind of been borne out in my own experience. And so if you have that, then you start to really think that you might have an endotracheal malposition issue. You also have to, of course, check the recording side with grounding, interface box, impedance, the, is the tube touching okay? And then the corrective maneuver is to stimulate the vagus nerve and the anesthesiologist can reposition the tube for you. Now, if that laryngeal twitch is absent, you see the nerve fine, you, you stimulate it, but you don't feel the, the muscle jump and it's a very distinct jump you'll feel, then you're starting to worry about a stimulation side um, issue. And so there might be some issue with your stimulation uh, probe. If you stimulate the vagus and it's present, uh, then on the opposite side, on the contralateral side, then you're really worried that you do have a nerve injury. And, and that could be exactly what's going on where you may need to certainly stage that surgery or consider holding off on going to the other side. Uh, and for those of you unfamiliar with that palpation twitch, this is what we're talking about. You're simply putting your finger behind the larynx here, touching the posterior cricorytenoid muscle, that's your inferior constrictor by your cricopharyngeus, and there's the nerve. Here's the nerve being stimulated, and you will feel a very distinct twitch in that area uh, when you go ahead and stimulate that. And I encourage everyone, if you've never done that, to do that on your next thyroid. Um, when we look at the false positive test, that means the EMG is bad, but your, your vocal cord function's fine. Your vocal cord's fine. That's usually because of the endotracheal tube being malpositioned. Um, but there may be issues where the EMG signal has changed, but not significantly. There may be some blood or fascia over the nerve. So you might be stimulating the nerve, but it's getting interfered with because of blood or fascia. Your anesthesiologist may be using a muscle relaxant. Um, I'm in an academic center. We have people coming in and out of cases all the time, people in training. It's important to keep that communication line intact so that um, we don't have a, you know, a deviation from our initial strategy that we talked about at the outset of the case. There can be a stimulation artifact cutoff. And then uh, it could be a situation where um, you actually did lose signal, but there was a rapid neural recovery. Now, a false negative test, that's when the EMG is good, so you think you're fine, but the vocal cord's paralyzed or you have a weakness afterwards. Well, if you've hurt the nerve proximally, let's say down by the thoracic inlet, and you're stimulating it high like I showed right by the larynx, that's a distal stimulation. And you're going to have a nice movement of the vocal cords, but the injury was proximal to where you're stimulating. There may be a downsloping final EMG, so there might be uh, an injury in progress. There may have been a stimulation that was fine, but then you did some more hemostasis. Maybe you created a cautery injury. 
and that was and you didn't retest so after i do any hemostasis after i do any you know uh further maneuvers my last move is to stimulate that nerve uh so that i know that it's functioning correctly at, at the final closure there may be a bit of a delayed neuropraxia um there could have been a posterior branch injury um and so uh it's something that you didn't recognize from the extralaryngeal branching and then there could be some things not due to surgical neural injury, uh, perhaps a retinoid dislocation or, or edema. These are a bit more rare. So I, I wanted to leave time uh, for discussion here uh, with Dr. Erkin and, and, the, and the attendees, but I really do thank Dr. Erkin, the Thank Foundation for all the wonderful work it's done for our patients and for our providers. And um, I think at that point, we'll probably go to perhaps some questions that we might have. Joe, thank you. That was uh, truly an awesome um, uh, overview and uh, an in-depth understanding of uh, what the role of nerve monitoring is in routine in thyroid surgery. Um, maybe you can drop back for a second. Um, I think there was a lot of delay in adoption of um, this, uh, this technique in uh, routine surgery. Where do you think we are now uh, with respect to um, the legal climate? Uh, this certainly comes into play, and maybe if you can talk a little bit about the economics of this uh, with respect to added cost, um, if you're if you are aware of that. Sure, sure. Great questions. Um, I think, uh, particularly for younger physicians, for some of the evidence that's out there to suggest that it can help their rates of um, success be that of more experienced surgeons. I think uh, it's been adopted by many younger surgeons. I think there was a lot of hesitation to adopt this technology because, um, first of all, for experienced surgeons, the rates of neural injury are actually quite low. And many uh, surgeons, um, when you look at the literature, you cannot really prove with meta-analysis or other issues that this prevents nerve injury for most patients. And so there was a lot of hesitancy there to say, why should we adopt this? But it's not necessarily... Um, looking at it simply from preventing the nerve injury, but kind of looking at it from the standpoint of uh, a safety profile for the patients. And there is economic data there from a paper for Dr. al Qureshi and Dr. Randolph, where they did a Monte Carlo analysis to see what the cost would be for a single bilateral vocal cord injury that could result in a tracheotomy for a typical patient undergoing a thyroid who would be, I think in their case example, a female in her 40s. And it's, it's, it did become an economically uh, important um, issue. If you get just one of those type of injuries, um, the amount of care and treatment is enormous for the patients. Um, from a medical legal standpoint, I, you know, I, I don't, I, we're actually not allowed to do medical legal work at the Cleveland Clinic, um, just as, as a, a function of the institution. Although I do get a lot of stuff, people calling in about if I would be available, but we don't do it. Um, so I'm not an expert to, to comment on that. I would say, if you're going to do this, I think it would be a bit unethical to just simply put a tube in place to think it's given you medical legal protection if you're not taking the time to understand what the, 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 the information you're receiving back from the monitoring is giving you. You really wanna know what that information is to do the best for the patient. And to simply put a tube in there thinking it's gonna give you some medical legal protection and not really listen to what your monitors are saying, not looking at the MGs, I think in my view would be a bit of an unethical extra expense that you shouldn't put the expense on. You shouldn't spend the money on that. Um, I've gotten used to doing it in such a fashion that I've become a proponent of using it in all my cases. The past several years, I've actually been uh, privileged to uh, been invited to Germany to lecture four or five years. In Germany, it is a standard of care. You are not allowed to do a case without nerve monitoring. Um, and in fact, at the end of their cases, they have to show EMG results for the patients. And if you did not have EMG capability at your center, you'd have to tell the patient that and refer them to a center where they did. They do not want to have these bilateral injuries. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a little bit different everywhere, but I, it, I would not call it a standard of care in the United States. But in some countries, such, such as Germany, it is absolutely a standard of care. Thanks, Joe. Um, that's actually an interesting question. Do you, do you record um, as part into the uh, into the patient chart the results of your um, uh, nerve monitoring and your final uh, final results at the end? 
I don't, I don't put, I don't record it off it. I will put in my op note that I use nerve monitoring and I usually will tell them what the signal was at the end in my op note, but I don't have the, a formal uh, recording place in the chart. Okay. So um, a number of questions here. Let me start with the first one by Dr. Persky and wanting to know whether or not you can have um, an iatrogenic, iatrogenic injury to the nerve through overstimulation. Do you have any experience or thoughts about that? Yeah, that, that has been looked at. And, and the answer has been no, actually, from uh, if you're keeping it. So usually um, you're doing a, a super, so threshold stimulation is usually by three to four milliamps. So often we will do a super threshold stimulation at 0.8 milliamps. At one milliamp with continued stimulation, no, I would say no, but here's the caveat. I have heard from Dr. Terrace or other people, sometimes the pointy pras probe, if you're poking at the nerve, you may get a physical trauma on the nerve. You have to be careful. And so I, there's some practitioners like Dr. Terrace who uses a probe that's got more of a ball on the end, so it won't poke the nerve. But just simply from the uh, amplitude of the stimulation at one milliamp, even up to two milliamps, and repetitive stimulation should not um, fatigue or um, uh, paralyze the nerve. Great, okay. Um, one of our uh, attendees um, has raised a question about continuous nerve monitoring um, and uh, the positioning and risk or um, problem of uh, extrusion of the stimulator. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, so you do have to be careful with how that wire comes out. So it's not something that I routine. I do not routinely do uh, continuous nerve monitoring. Um, but when you do do it, you have to be careful that right that it doesn't get pulled out and yank on the nerve. And so one thing you can do is um, uh, bring it through some of the musculature, for example, the SCM muscles, strap muscles, other things, so that there's a little bit of a barrier where it's. Um, uh, held in place and that it's not just free floating where someone's hand might hit the uh, the, the wire and, and pull the whole thing. So you want to be cognizant of that. That's a great question. Great. Um, and one other question. Um, do you, your thoughts about um, the importance of vagal stimulation and whether you do that um, at the outset of every case um, and, uh, and use that for comparison to your um, stimulation of the RLN. Right. So that <laughs> so that's a great uh, question, and it's something that I'm always straightforward and honest about. I so the nerve the nerve monitoring study guidelines are to stimulate the vagus nerve. In practice, I actually do not on every case stimulate the vagus nerve on every single one of mine. Um, you know, some of them are very easy to do because I get a lot of uh, thyroid lateral neck dissection. So I'll start on the lateral neck first and you have the vagus right there to stimulate first. But we do work through very small incisions at times and then you have to move over to get it. I think um, as I've thought about this a lot through introspection um, and just my own results and, and you know, if, if you're not getting a lot of these issues, um, you know, I, I feel pretty comfortable not on every single case, even though <laughs> it puts me a little bit of an uncomfortable position because I am on those guideline papers that I don't necessarily always subscribe to doing on every case, stimulating the vagus nerve. Okay. Um, can you uh, talk for just a minute about um, perhaps how nerve monitoring has affected surgical technique? Um, either globally or um, in individual cases here? Yeah. Um, I think um, it certainly has made uh, a nice impact for younger surgeons, but I think I'm very fortunate that I trained before it existed because it really made me more dependent on being very careful about the anatomy. And I really emphasize that to our young trainees too, about their technique to really not ever rely on nerve monitoring uh, when, you're, when you're dissecting so that you're really focused on your technique more than anything. And then this nerve monitoring is an adjunct. And so I don't want them, any of them to be a little bit more uh, cavalier or rough around the nerve the way they touch it, uh, because um, those are the, they're gonna be the issues that get into problems with nerves. And so um, I think if you're already trained and you're used to you know, being very careful around the nerves, it's a wonderful adjunct. But I think we have to have some caution with our younger trainees um, uh, to tell them um, to be very careful. Analogous to maybe sinus surgery where you never want to be dependent on just the image guidance and, and still rely on your anatomic knowledge. 
I think that's a great word of uh, word of advice, Joe. What if you think back? What was it that um, changed your mind about the use of nerve monitoring um, from perhaps some initial reluctance uh, to um, uh, using it in all cases? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think the way my own practice ended up developing, similar to yours, I have a lot of invasive thyroid cancers, I have a lot of revision cases, a lot of difficult cases. And, you know, I, you know, I, I was very influenced by Dr. Greg Randolph and other leaders that really pushed this forward and, and gave it a try. And it just uh, started to grow on me. And I, I decided, uh, similar to what I said, there is a learning curve. And if I was going to do these on the invasive cases and the revision cases, I want to make sure I've had a full understanding on all cases, and that's a good way to start with. And it is true that um, even though you might think you have a simple, straightforward case, you can't always predict that. And so it starts to grow on you in that aspect, too, where you want to use it on all your cases to keep that continuity. Great. Um, talk for just a minute, Joe, as we sort of, as we start to wind down here, just talk for a little bit about um, the situation where you've got uh, you've elected, you've got a loss of signal, and you've made the decision you're going to um, back away. Um, talk a little bit about the timing of uh, re-intervention and um, how that plays out in your mind here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if if you have a situation like that, I'll usually bring the patient back a week later, scope them to see what their their status is of the nerve, uh, and how the vocal cord function, if it's been a quick reconstitution, uh, I'll put them on as soon as I can. I, I actually never go, to, so I never uh, start to just dissect on the other side. I keep that all as a virgin tissue plane. So I don't care if I go in a day, a week, 10 weeks later, it doesn't matter to me. There'll be scar under the skin, but all the critical structures on the contralateral side will have been untouched. So I really don't care from a timing standpoint as long as I see that reconstitution of function. And, um, do you you've have you been in situations where because of the virulence of the disease and the need to give um, uh, radioactive iodine that you've made the decision to go back uh, um, before you've had a return of signal or a return of a functioning cord? Mm -hmm. uh, I have not had one of those situations necessarily on my own patient, but I've I've had a lot of patients referred in who needed surgery who have had only solitary nerves. It's an uncomfortable situation, but I've certainly had a lot of those I've had to deal with, and, and I've gone and operated on them if the indications were, were present, you know, to do. So um, if I, I wouldn't, you know, if, if there was the right indication and in, and in, in a person, particularly, you know, a younger person with gross structural disease needed further surgery, um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd be back in to deal with that nerve, the solitary okay. nerve. Yeah. Um, uh, so... You mentioned uh, some of the work that was pioneered by Catherine Sinclair on yep. the laryngeal adductor um, reflex, and really what um, I, I came to that uh, technology uh, probably about three or four years ago when um, I, I um, had the opportunity to, uh, to be in the same institution where Catherine had done that work. Unfortunately, she has moved back to Australia, hopefully temporarily. Um, otherwise, I am certain that she would have been on this call and um, been able to speak directly. But one of the um, amazing parts of that um, technology is the ability to uh, look at the entire integrity of the superior laryngeal nerve, the vagus, the brainstem, mm -hmm. the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, that whole pathway um, is evaluated uh, continuously through um, uh, through the operation, and so you have the incredible benefit of getting a continuous readout. Um, it does require additional manpower in having um, a neurophysiologist watching and um, the signals on the monitor, um, and so that additional cost is perhaps uh, not available or um, uh, allowable in. Uh, many situations, uh, but it it has provided just this remarkable feedback um, on a on a second by second uh, basis of what you're doing in that um, neural pathway, and probably the most reliable um, method in my mind um, for uh, for assessment. 
Um, it's prone to some of the same difficulties that you alluded to with positioning of the endotracheal tube. Um, and so sometimes if you're in a difficult case and you manipulate the laryngotracheal complex, you will get um, a change in your signals as a result of that. Um, but it's a remarkable technology that I um, really owe to uh, Catherine and her work um, in pioneering that. So um, with that, um, I, I, I think we should um, bring this to a close. I, I can't thank you enough, Joe. This was really an, an outstanding uh, presentation. Um, and I am sure that all of our listeners uh, benefited greatly. I think it's imperative that the, um, that this become just a not not necessarily a, a surgical discussion, but um, a discussion that uh, our colleagues in endocrinology and nuclear medicine understand what it is that we're doing um, so that they can be a part of the team and understand when we're talking about um, loss of signal and what some of the uh, realities of that are that they truly understand um, what the implications are. So um, with that, Joe, thank you. Um, and thanks to everybody uh, in attendance and certainly look forward to you joining us again uh, next Friday. Everybody stay safe and uh, hope you get vaccinated. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Take care. You too. Thank you.